Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? That's what I'm talking about. You guys are awake and ready to go and to have some fun. Let me tell you, uh, today is an amazing day. And if I have never met you before, my name is Jared and I'm one of the pastors here at the Shore Church. And if it's your first or your second time here with us today, we just want to welcome you in. We have a gift specifically for you. If it's your first time, make sure you swing by the Welcome Center on your way out. I want to make sure that we give you that. It's a Starbucks gift card. We just want to say, hey, thanks for coming because we're glad that you came here. And if it's your second time, we have an even better gift that we want to give to you. So make sure you swing by there. We just want to say, hey, thanks for coming back. Glad we didn't scare you off off the first time, okay? So it's part of that process, our little thank you um, to you. And, and like I said, we're going, um, or my name is Jared, and kind of, if you haven't seen me before, I hang out in Growth Track, so if you haven't seen me, then you haven't been to Growth Track, meaning you should go to Growth Track, okay? Just go ahead, put that out there right now. But we talk about Growth Track as being one of the, the most important things that we do here at the Shore. Everything is important, and, and, and it's, it is so important for you to know why you exist. And that is what the Growth Track is a part of. That's what the Growth Track is designed to do, and I get the pleasure of serving on an amazing team that actually helps helps people find out specifically what it is that God has planned for their life, what he wants to do with them and how he wants to use them to change the world. So if you've never done that, you have to do it. It takes place every Sunday, or the, every first four Sundays of every month, and it's, it's during second service. So you can come to first service and then, then drop on in there at second service. We would love to hang out with you and get to know you. So we are in week number four of this series called Detox, okay? So the first thing that I have to tell you, and if, we, if you haven't met me before, you wouldn't know uh, this, but every time I come up here, they go, you got to give them a little disclaimer, Jared, because you say whatever comes to your mind at any point in time throughout the service. <clears throat> so this is your 25 second warning. If you have a child in here under the age of 13, we're going to talk about some real stuff today because this is church and I believe that the church should talk about some real things. It should be a resource. So it is, this service will be PG-13. So if you need to check out and check your t one of your children into the amazing children ministries that we have here, right now is your time to go. You can grab coffee on the way back and just get ready. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, but the reason why we do that is because we don't want to pay for your therapy later, okay? So it is for you that we're doing that, all right? But but this series has been amazing because we've been talking about detox, and, and we've been talking about the detox of our mind, body, and our soul. And ultimately, we've been going to God's Word on how we can improve our lives and how we can see, you know, how we can get live a life that's better, a life that is of more, where we can experience the fullness and the greatness that God has promised for every single one of us. And this series has been one that's literally changed my life. Every single week, I've walked out of here going, my life is different. This was good. This, this was relevant. This was something that I can relate to. And I've been fired up so much about this message because it's one that I can personally say that I've dealt with over and over again. And, and what, when it comes to things and every single thing that we've talked about and everything that, that we've talked about as a church, I've dealt with on a, on a level either once in my life or probably 50, 100, 150, 200 times. And today's no different. And what, when we were setting this series up, we talked about the church as a resource. And so many times when it comes to the church, people use the church as a last resort. They go, when their marriage is at the point where they're about to get a divorce, if they're failing, then they'll go, we should go to the church and see if we can get some answers. Uh, the church is a last resource when it comes to making better decisions financially. That's why we do Financial Peace University. The church is, has become a, a last resource for us when it comes to things that we deal with in our lives, problems and, and hangups that are constantly uh, giving us these issues over and over again. And this series has been designed to go, hold up. The church should not be the last resort. It should be the first place that we go. It should be the resource for us. And that is what this series has done for us and it has been so amazing. So if you've missed any of those, you can go back and listen to them. Uh, the previous messages on our podcast, this one will be on there um, as well coming up this next week. And, and I can honestly say that I'm, I'm glad that the church is becoming that resource um, because me personally, I never go to the church when I had an issue in my life. I never have. Um, I do what most of you, probably some of you do, maybe not all of you. But the first thing that I go to as a resource is Google. Anybody else that does that, right? So it's like, I have a problem in my life. The answer is on Google because everything on the internet is true. 
If you were wondering, I just wanted to give you that information, okay? Everything that's there is true. And, and so I'll tell you, I just want to tell you a little story about, about what I do. Normally you go to family, you go to friends, but first thing I go to Google. And if you can't learn it on YouTube, it's not that important, okay? It is not that important because if somebody didn't make a video about it, I mean, you can learn how to do anything on that stuff. And, and so it's really important to every single one of us. But what I've done is, and when my wife was pregnant with our first child, okay, so I have two boys, two amazing boys. They are so awesome. And I'd lived with my wife. We've been together for about a year and we're going, okay, we're going to have a baby. It's going to be great. And then we get pregnant, we get pregnant, or we didn't get pregnant. She got pregnant. And uh, it was my fault that it happened, but it's great. Great, okay, is what we were going after. But, but, but so, so she's pregnant, and then all of a sudden things change. And people, you know, they tell you all your friends that care about you, but they don't really. But they care about you. They go, listen, when you have kids, your life changes forever. When really, when, you get, when your wife gets pregnant, your life changes forever, okay? And if you've been here, you've experienced that. Because things happen in a woman's body when they get pregnant, right? Okay, all the women in the room are silent. Come on, I'm helping you out here right now. You know what I'm talking about, okay? Things change in our lives, and, and, and especially with women. So my wife, I love her pieces. I had to ask her if it was okay if I shared this before I came up here because I don't want to get hit and hurt uh, later. You know, it's like <laughs> sometimes it's better to ask first than ask for forgiveness uh, later. But I, I told her, you know, uh, we, were, we were younger and, we, and I, I remember we, we had this moment where we had this ultimate, we were having this cool high, everything's great, we're having so much fun and, and then all of a sudden emotions just change and now she's crying and we're in this crazy moment of, I'm like, what happened? Like, what did, how did we get here? And inevitably those things happen when we got to go to work, right? I'm like one foot out the door and here come the tears. I'm like, no, what do I do? How do I do this? So I remember, I remember leaving, trying to make things better and patching things up because that's what men do. Okay, women, if you don't know that, we, we problem solve. That's, that's our design. Design. Even though we don't know the answer, we're still trying to fix the problem that's in your life. That is our job, okay? Um, and you can, you can just embrace that and go, well, they're full of it. That's all right, but just embrace us. Give us a little shot there. Um, but I remember trying to do that. So I get in the car. First thing I do, thank God for technology, I pull up Google and I go, how do I deal with my wife's pregnancy? And I ask that question straight up. I'm like, my wife's pregnant. How do I deal with it? How do I deal with it? And thank God I found a forum. There was a forum for people just like me, guys. I'm telling you, it was so great. So I get on this forum and I, and I start, th and I'm like reading through it. There's all kinds of stuff, you know, things that you can do and how you can do things. But the one that caught my attention more than anything else, it was in all capital letters and I love it. And it said this, it said, deal with it. <laughs> deal with it. And it was like, get over it. She has a human being growing inside of her. There's some things bound to change in your wife's life. That is what is going to happen. So get over it. Okay. You can't fix this problem. You, you are the problem. You are the one that started that. And it is, it, it's up. It, now you just have to deal with it. Okay. That's what happened. But I, I remember going through that going, man, I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Okay. I'm glad I'm not alone in that process. And this series is designed to do that for us. It's designed for us to be as the church, to be a resource for the struggles that we have in our life. For the things that, that we're dealing with. It's great to come here and have amazing music. I mean, this worship team delivers every single time above and beyond. And I have such an amazing experience every time I hear I'm here. That coffee is amazing. My life's changed. I'm greeted in a way that is life changing for me. And this is a part of it. But if you walk into this place and you walk out the same, that you, the same way that you walked in, then we're not doing our job right. We are supposed to be a resource for you to help your life become better. And that's what we wanted to do in this series. So, so far, we've talked about many different things in this series. And I'll talk about what our action steps were. But at the beginning of, of this series, we talked about spending time in God's word. And that we have to spend time in his word every single day. And that's how we're going to, you know, get the best out of our life, get the best out of our days. Uh, we talked about social media. We talked about that comparison trap that every single one of us get into. You know, Pastor TJ, he showed that video. If you guys remember him catching that fish. Now, listen, I, did, I never saw that fish in the boat, so it didn't count. Until I see that fish in the boat, then it done, didn't count, okay? So that's what I believe on that, all right? So I'm just saying it was a great, it was a great video. It was awesome. Um, but that's what, you know, what, it's that comparison trap. It's, we, it's so easy for us to get into that. Um, and then last week we talked about, you know, changing our mindset, changing our thoughts. And we had some thought conditioners, and, and we were discussing uh, those things and how we can overcome depression. And this week we're going to talk about it, and we're going to take it a little step further. But before I do that, I want to ask you a question, okay? And you have to, we're in church, so you can't lie, okay? That's how it works. But raise your hand in this room if you have a bad habit. Raise your hand all around. Bad habits. Look around. Everybody look around. Everybody look around. You, you guys see people that don't have their hands up? They have a bad habit of lying, okay? <laughs> so now we're all in the same boat, every single one of us, okay? We all have some bad habits. So as a pastor, I just want you to know I have some bad habits, and I'll tell you about those um, because everybody's interested. Like, what's pastors? They, pastors have bad habits? They do. So <laughs> my wife laughs the loudest. Did you guys hear that? I mean, come on. It's great. It's awesome. Um, but, but we do. We have bad. So my, my, probably my worst habit is that I bite my fingernails. 
Okay, anybody else, any nail biters in the room? Nobody raising their hand because they don't want to admit to that. Look, okay, a couple people, that's what I'm talking about. All right, listen, I bite my finger. I, I can't tell you the last time I've ever clipped my fingernails in my life. It's probably never happened before because that's just what I do. I just take care of those things right here. You know, so I can just handle that business. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that in front of you guys. But that's a bad habit. I know it's a bad habit. Listen, after I shake all of your guys' hands, I promise that I wash my hands before I put them in my mouth. Okay, I promise you that that happens. But, but we all have bad habits, okay? The struggle is real, all right? But you can't judge me because we're in church. Don't do that, all right? Outside of here, you do whatever you want. But come on, I'm not judging you for your bad habit. Um, so the next question I have for you, I want you to ask is, and, and you, you don't have to answer this about yourself, but you can, you can answer it about somebody else because that's always a lot easier. But raise your hand if you know somebody that has an addiction in their life. Raise your hand. All around the room. Everybody knows, everybody knows somebody that has an addiction or two or 12, or 15. I mean, we all know somebody that's got some addictions. And, and addictions in our lives, they control us. They ultimately define what we pursue in our lives. And, and they become something in our life that we're constantly chasing after. Addictions can be good things. They can be things like we chase after money because we want to be successful. We chase after a career because we want to set our family up for some amazing things. They could be our spouses that we're addicted to pleasing our spouses or pleasing people. They can be uh, bad addictions that are in our lives. And they can be addictions that hold us back, that hold us captive. But addictions all do the same thing. Whether they're good or bad, they control us in some way, shape, or form. They, they lead us to something over and over again and something that we chase after over and over again. So going back to me, because it's easier for me to talk about me, um, I have some addictions in my life, in case you were wondering. It's, I deal with them every day. Um, the number one addiction that is in my life is coffee. The number one addiction. Let me tell you. Um, I'll tell you how bad it is. That I, I, I go to, so every morning you think, man, what's a pastor do when he first wakes up? He probably has this like anointing, he has these anointed shoes that he puts on, these slippers <laughs> that he like slips through the house. The first thing I do in the morning when I get up is I go to the coffee maker and I just, I'm like right there just making some coffee. And then once I get a cup of coffee, I get to go sit down and I can read the Bible. But, but I got to have that coffee. Those two things have to go hand in hand because there's just something about sipping that cup of coffee and going, that's good. This is good. This is all good. You know, and that's, I, that's something I deal with. And here's how I know that it's an addiction, okay? You laugh because it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Two weeks out of the year, I give up coffee, and I am probably the ugliest person you have ever seen in your life. I just, nobody wants to be around me. Nobody wants to deal with me because I'm angry. I'm upset because I got headaches. You know, these, this, thing, this thing drives me. It drives me first thing in the morning. It's one that I deal with. Another one that I have as an addiction is food. I love food. Did you know that I plan my entire day around food? My, my entire day is planned. And, and let me tell you how bad it is. When, when I get up in the morning, I think, hmm, what am I going to have for breakfast? This is going to be good. I'm excited today. My day depends on how good my breakfast is going to be. And if it's a bad breakfast, you know the rest of the day is gone. You might as well give up. So while I'm at breakfast, I'm thinking about lunch. I'm going, man, what am I going to eat for lunch? Man. And you know, my decision for lunch will actually change what my plans are for dinner. Because if I go to Chipotle for lunch, I am definitely not having Mexican at home for dinner. It's just not going to happen. I got, so, that, so my food changes my thought and changes what my direction is on my life. It is, is an addiction. And, uh, and one of the last ones that I'll talk to you about specifically today, another addiction is clothing. Clothing and shoes specifically. Something that I, I am addicted to. I pl pick out my outfit this outfit was picked out a couple weeks ago, I believe. No, it's like, like I pulled the tag off this shirt this morning because I'm like, I just can't wear it. I haven't worn it on Sunday yet. This, this is a special Sunday. I get to bring God's word. This is a holy shirt. This is this great moment. And, uh, and it's just like, this. What, see, this is what happens in my life. Now you guys know. You thought it was just you. It's not. It's me too. Okay. But, but it's something I plan my whole day. And depending on what I do that day, it changes what my outfit's going to look like. I'm not going to wear my good shoes if we're going to play in the mud. Like, that's not going to happen. So, so I'm addicted to this. It constant, it's constantly something that I, that's driving me, that's, that's pushing me towards a direction or making me think about it. And it's over and over again, the things that I deal with. And many of us have some other addictions in our life. And when we say addictions, immediately you think about drugs, alcohol, you know, all kinds of other things that, that, we, that many people deal with. And those are severe addictions. Those are more addictions that actually... Actually, um, they don't just affect us, but they affect everybody around us. So what I wanted to do today in this series is talk to you about some pretty real addictions and how I know it is based on some statistics that I learned off the internet. Because again, everything on the internet is true. All right, but these are real, okay? These are real things, all right? But if you didn't know this, I just wanted to point it out to you because I believe that it's something that the church should be talking about. So one out of every 10, every 10 people, one out of 10 people struggles with an alcohol addiction. One out of 10. Did you know that one out of 10 people struggle with a drug addiction in some way, shape, or form, whether it's, it is a prescription drug that I have to take sleeping medication in order to go to sleep. Um, I'm addicted to it. My allergies are bad. I take a Claritin every night before I go to bed, and that's like, because otherwise my day is going to be messed up. It's affecting me. But in some way, shape, or form, either, either drugs, good or bad, 
One out of every 10 people are addicted to those. And then one that is a little more devastating that I think is very important for every single one of us to talk about is that one out of every two people have looked at porn in the last week. In the last week. So in the past seven days, one out of every two has experienced that, has dealt with that. And it's a continuing process over and over again. And that's something that normally you would say, man, the church shouldn't talk about that kind of stuff. I believe with some addictions like this in our life, the church should talk about some of these things. The church should be a resource to say, what, why is these things so important? Why are these things drawing us? Why are they driving our lives? Why are, they, why are they something that we constantly go back to over and over again? And how do I overcome it? How do I overcome it? Because in this room, there's some people dealing with these addictions. And I think that it's time that we talk about it. Today, I want to be completely honest and completely real with you. Every single one of those addictions that I've talked about, I have personally dealt with not only once in my life, but multiple times in my life. Multiple different times throughout my life, I've personally dealt with those kinds of struggles and those kinds of issues. And, and I wish that I could tell you there's this three-step process to go, if you do A, B, and C, then this, you'll never have this issue again in your life. I wish that I could come up here and tell you that, but that's not true. There's not a simple process that you can do that's going to make that change, that's going to make that addiction that's going to take that away from your life. What, what it is, is it's a conscious decision every single day that we have to make. And I want to show you some people in the Bible that have struggled with that. And, and what we're going to do today is go to one of, the most, one of the characters that I love most in the Bible. And he's one that I talk about very often. Um, but he actually wrote most of the New Testament. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, which the New Testament, if you're new to church or you're not a Christian here, that is the time after Jesus came to earth that God sent his son Jesus. Jesus lived. So it talks about that. And then it talks about the early church of when Jesus died and he was, you know, rose again by God. That is what, that is what the New Testament is designed to do and designed to show us. And Paul wrote most of that New Testament. And, and if you have read any of the Bible, you would have to say that Paul is a Christian. He's a godly man. And I would argue that he's probably one of the most godly people in all of the world, in all of history, in all of time. Paul knew the law and people say that Paul would have had the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament. So the time before Jesus came, People would say that, that he would have, he'd have that whole piece memorized by heart, that he could just fire it off at any point in time. He had it all memorized. Paul knew what, the, what it was to do that, and he actually worked in that. That was what he did for a living. He knew what he was supposed to do, and then he had an, had an encounter with Jesus. But see, Paul also dealt with something that you and I deal with every single day. He dealt with some struggles. He dealt with some things that held his thoughts captive. He dealt with some things that held him back over and over again. And as I was studying this week, God was just completely blowing my mind in this process and being able to see this. And what we're going to do today is we're going to pick up in the book of Romans. And this is Paul writing the, a letter to the church of Rome. And we're going to talk about this and we're going, to, we're going to dive into this. But I really want you to see Paul who is... I mean, one of the godliest people in all the world. You would think he's got it right. Paul doesn't deal with any issues. He doesn't have any struggles or any pains in his life. You, this is what we're going to do is see how real Paul is. So on the screens, you can see it. You can follow along there. It says, Paul is saying this. He says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not, the one, really, not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. And I want you to think about that verse right there for just a second. That, that Paul is saying that there's a struggle that is happening in my life, and every single day I keep doing the thing that I know I shouldn't be doing. There's this war that's happening inside of my mind that is keeping me captive. I know what I shouldn't be doing, but I keep doing it anyway. And he says, uh, um, continue on, he goes, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who will free me from this? And what I love about this is that Paul just breaks this down and he's showing to us so, so, so real. He's going, listen, I'm dealing with some real stuff in my life. I'm, I keep doing the things over and over again that I know I shouldn't be doing. I keep going back to these things over and over again. This desire, these things that were the, of him to do what was wrong was controlling his life. 
It was ultimately controlling him because he kept going back and doing it over and over and over again, even though he knew what was right. Deep down inside, he knew and felt what was right, and he knew what the law was, but he kept doing, uh, going against it. So when I was looking at this and, and preparing for this message, and I love this, this, this section of Scripture, and we're really going to find the answer and how Paul has the answer for this, but I started thinking about the word addiction. And when I was thinking about the word addiction, I was, I was talking about it and going, okay, so here's an addiction. We know what an addiction is. It's something that drives us. It's something that compels us. We constantly go back to it over and over again. It's something that's in our mind that we're always thinking about. We're always conscious of this thing. It's an addiction that is in our life. So I go to Google, all right, and I find some interesting information. And on Google, I pull up the word addiction, and, you know, there's a see more tab, and you can see the information, some information about the word. And what you're going to see here is something that I believe is amazing, that over time, this is the mentions, that, how often this word was mentioned. Back in the 1800s, you'd never see this word. It wasn't even something that was discussed. But it wasn't until about 1950, right after 1950, you start to see this increase, and it takes off, and it's huge. And I believe that something was changing. Something's happened. So I'm going in my mind, okay, how can I go to the Bible and relate something that doesn't, that's not even talked about before our time, before this time period that we're living in now? How do I do that? So in my mind, I took a step back and I looked at that word and I looked about what it is that it's doing in our lives. I said, okay, an addiction is something that, that drives us. It's something that pushes us. It's something we're constantly thinking of. And in my mind, I think an addiction is a form of worship. It's something that, that I'm giving my time to, whether I work too much or whether I'm chasing a high or whether I'm chasing a dollar or whether I'm, I'm, I'm spending my, all my time doing something I know I shouldn't be doing, whether, I'm, whether I'm, I'm lacking something in my marriage so I go to pornography as to fill that need in my life. Whatever it is, it's something that's driving me in this direction. That's what an addiction is. And it's ultimately, it looks to me like it's some form of worship that, because it's something that's so important in our lives that we're, we're putting it in this place, an idol, a place that, that we go to, a place that we constantly are thinking about and something that we're constantly pursuing. So in my mind, I go, okay, well then, so it sounds like there's an idol. It sounds like something that we're dealing with in our life that, that is an idol that is in our life. So I thought about addiction and I looked this word up and I want you to see here, you'll see this, the, the graph that's right here. And then they're going to bring up the word idol. And as I was thinking about this and as I was looking at it, I'm going, there's a big change here. Over the period of time, go back to the word addiction. You can see where it starts to take its increase right here and go back now or go forward to the word idol. You can see that it was used so much over time and it receives its lowest point right here at that same time. So something crosses, something changes. Now I can tell you for a fact that right here at this mark, you're going to see that it starts to increase. That was when American Idol hit the scene, okay? So that's why you would notice an increase, okay, in that word. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there because this is what Google's showing you, that this word was used over time so many times for this. This is something that, that people are talking about. So in my mind, I'm going, okay, so an idol is something in our life that's drawing us. It's something that, that we're constantly going back to. It, it could be in the same form of an addiction in our lives. And it really is. Many of us go to this thing, this addiction that we have, because we're trying to find fulfillment in it. We're trying to find something that we're missing in our life. So if I feel better when I'm drunk, then I go to alcohol because it makes me feel better. It's an idol that I've put in my life that makes me feel more accomplished. If I'm chasing after money, when my bank accounts are overflowing, I go, man, I'm doing something right. And my life is good. I'm experiencing this fullness. If, I'm, if my marriage is falling apart and I'm not getting the fulfillment out of it I need, what do I do? I go to pornography as something to help me feel, meet that need in my life. And I think that it's something that every single one of us deal with. Those things, in some way, shape, or form, it's something that all of us can say that we deal with. But the difference is with those things is they always leave us empty. They always leave us lacking something. There is not a single thing out there that anybody can sit back and go, this makes me perfect. This makes me complete. Any person that you know that's one of the wealthiest people in the world, they'll go, money can't buy happiness. It can't do that for you. Pornography is not going to fix your marriage. It's going to hurt it. Drugs will only kill you over time. And you'll chase that high because it feels right and it feels good, but you always have to come back down. See, it seems to me that we have some idols in our lives, that, that as a struggle, this is something that we have that we're dealing with. And an idol is something that we're placing in our hearts in the place that only Jesus can, put it, can be, in the place that only Jesus can fit in our hearts and in our lives. And, and that experience, that fulfillment, Jesus can meet that need and he can satisfy that need inside of us. And Paul knew that, so in just a minute we're going to go back to Paul and we're going to see what his answer is and how he responds. But that's deep down inside, that's why we can say that no matter what, anytime we do any of those things that we're addicted to, they leave us feeling empty. They leave us feeling like we're not quite full. 
there's not something as good as I thought it was going to be. See, Paul knew what it was like to deal with this kind, of, this kind of a process. He knew what it was like to go back to something over and over again. Or else, why would he have gone back to it? He was trying to experience something in it, and he was doing something over and over again, and ultimately it was affecting him. Verse 24, which is where we left off in the previous, uh, the previous verse from Paul, said this. It says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Verse 25 says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's going, listen, the answer is Jesus. If we're in church, the answer is always Jesus. But the answer in our lives, that thing that we're going to, that idol that we keep going back to, it's that lack of Jesus in that place. That Jesus is not in that place of, of, of where he's supposed to be in our life. And he's causing us to be distracted and pulled apart from that. And what I love is that when you continue on in that verse, he says this. He says, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And then, then the book, it's the chapter's over. And so many times if you read the Bible like I do, you just read in chapters, right? And you go, that's it, cool, hang it up, done, that was awesome. But it's a letter to the church of Rome, which means it continues on. There's no chapters in this letter. You don't write chapters in a letter when you're sending it to somebody. It continues in chapter 8, verse 1. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. See, the righteous requirements of the law needed to be met. So God sent Jesus to make that happen for us. It says, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, the law in the Bible and, and what is set up in the Old Testament is that sin in our lives separates us from God because God is holy. God can't be a part of that. So that's what happens. So people and oftentimes churches go, you need to, you know, turn or burn. You need to give your life to Jesus or else you're going to burn in hell. And in our lives, that's that to me, I, that puts God in this mean place, in this place of, of anger, in this place of I just want I just want you to burn because you're not doing what, I, what you're supposed to do. But in reality, what it is, is that term holy means that God is set apart. And, and hell is not a place that we go because we sin. Hell is a place that we go because we're separated from God. And if you look at the Bible, what I love about the Bible more than anything else is that from the beginning of time, every single character in the Bible fails. Every single one. Every single one, it points back to Jesus. And people say, well, the Bible, points all, the Bible always points back to Jesus. The Old Testament, the New Testament always points back to Jesus. And at first I'm going, well, that doesn't quite make sense to me because the Bible, some there's history, there's poetry, there's all kinds of things. But what you'll see in the Bible over and over again, for example, David, who was the, his title was the man after God's own heart. I mean, come on, somebody like that, you think he's got it together. He's got it right. He killed a guy because he slept with his, that guy's wife. But yet he was the man after God's own heart. He had this thing that was in his life that he dealt with. And Paul, the same thing. He had this thing that he dealt with. And over and over again, what the scriptures are showing us and what the Bible is showing us is that no matter what, we're never going to have what it takes. And God knew that from the very beginning. That's why he sent Jesus. He had that plan. He had that purpose. He said, you know, I've got something and I'm about to pull that out and lives are going to be changed. John 3, 16, one of the most quoted verses in all of the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Meaning God loved the world so much. He didn't hate the world. He wasn't out to, to kill you. He wasn't out to cause you to have this pain. He loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross and to pay the price for us, that ultimate separation. Because in the Old Testament, the way that we had to get to God, to get back in that place of worship, to get back in that place of right standing with God, an offering had to be made. And Jesus was God's plan for that. Because he knew, God knew, no matter what, these people are going to fail. They're going to deal with the same thing over and over and over again. That's why he sent Jesus, to be that sacrifice to us, to come and to live that perfect life and to die ultimately once and for all for that sin that's in our lives. See, Paul said that he failed over and over again and he knew better and he still did what was wrong. He still did over and over again the wrong things. But he also knew the solution. He knew the solution to his problem was Jesus. See, we all have something in our lives that we're going to go to over and over again. Every one of us has something, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a hang-up, whether it's a hurt. 
It's something that we're constantly going to go back to over and over and over again. And really, it's time that we as a church call them what they are in our lives. It's time we call them what they are. We have to call these things that we're dealing with, these things that we're carrying everywhere we go, exactly what they are. So we've had an action step every single week. And, and, and what they're going to bring up on the slides is all the action steps that we've had and the things that we've talked about. And in that, you'll see week number one was to spend time with God. Week two, I talked about this earlier, is take a break from social media. Week three was memorize a verse. Today, this week is what we're going to do is we're going to call it what it is. That's our goal is to, we, we need to call it what it is. That's our action step this week is to say, you know what? I'm dealing with some things in my life. It's time that I call it what it is. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9 breaks it down for us. And he says, three times I pleaded to the Lord to take it away. Paul's going, listen, I got some problems in my life. I've got some issues that I'm dealing with in my life. He says, three times I pleaded to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So we need to call it what it is. In our lives, we have some issues. We have some things that are holding us captive, some things that we keep going to over and over again that we know we shouldn't. So I think it's time we make that action step forward and to call it what it is once and for all. It's easy to sit in this room and to go, man, there's no condemnation in Christ. That is awesome. I can keep going and doing what I'm doing over and over again. Listen, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. It is okay for us not to be okay. Paul's saying, listen, I, I know that I'm not okay. I know that I keep going back to this over and over again, but it is not okay for me to stay that way. So this week, to go along with our action step, underneath your chairs, you have one of these. I want you to go ahead and grab it and put it in your hands. Take it out. It's right underneath your chair. If your neighbor can't reach it, get it for them. Help a neighbor out here. In our lives, every single one of us have something that we're dealing with. And this trophy, this trophy is designed to represent for, that for us. That thing that keeps controlling us. That thing that we keep going back to over and over again. It's that thing in our lives that we need to call it what it is. And when we talked about this message, we said, man, you know what? We're going to give people something that they're going to take home. Something that, that, that we're pointing it out to go, hey, they're dealing with this issue. So we're going to send it home with them. Does that sound like a good idea? You're already carrying it home with you anyway. You're already taking that thing with you everywhere you go. Every time you get up in the morning, everything that you're, that's holding your thoughts captive, everything, every time you have that thought that you know you shouldn't have, you're already taking it with you everywhere you go. It's time that we call it what it is. So what I want you to do is to think about that thing that's in your life that's holding you captive. When you look at this trophy, that's what this is. So I'll tell you what this trophy is in my life. I took some markers and on your way out, there's some markers on the tables that are out there in the lobby. And you can write on here whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life, whatever it is that's, that's holding you captive in your thoughts. And on mine, I wrote porn and drugs. Because these are things that in my life that I've dealt with. These are thoughts in my life that I constantly have. When I'm at home by myself, nobody else is around, I can do whatever I want. These are thoughts that cross my mind. And I know where these thoughts lead. I know what they do. And I know that they're out there to hurt me and ultimately to take something from me. See, this trophy in my life, it represents exactly what it is currently because I've dealt with these things over and over again, porn and drugs and alcohol, chasing money, chasing everything. I've dealt with these things and as a reminder, that's what this is. And right now in your life, this might be a problem, but God wants to make this a trophy. He wants to turn this thing that's so bad into something that you look back and go, I got this. I remember what God's done in my life. I remember the things that he's taken, the things that I've overcome, the problems that I was dealing with. I remember what those are. So no longer this is in my life is not something that, that I look to as a bad thing. This is something that through Jesus I've overcome. And every day I'm making that conscious decision over and over again. See, the enemy tells us this, or, the, or Jesus tells us this, that the enemy's plan is to come and to steal, kill, and destroy. I mean, those addictions that are in your life, they're designed to do three things. Steal, kill, and destroy. But what does Jesus say his purpose is? My purpose is so that you'll have life and have it in abundance. 
that you'll have life to the fullest. So that's why Paul boasts all the more about the problems that was in his life, the problems that he dealt with, the thoughts that he constantly had over and over again. He goes, that's why I'll boast all the more about the issues that I have in my life, because I know the work that Jesus did on the cross for me. I know what he paid for. I know the sacrifice that this thing, this thing that separates me from God, I know what that cost. And I know that God loves me enough that he would send Jesus to do that, to take care of that for me, to be that sin offering for me. So in our lives, we have addictions. And the ultimate path away from a false God is the path towards the true one. We all have some idols that are in our lives. We all have something in our lives that's taken the place, that's taken the, that, that place that only Jesus can have in our lives. And the ultimate path away from that is towards the true one. So idols and addictions, they're not defeated in our life by being removed, but by being replaced. That these desires that I have to do drugs, to disappear, to drink, to watch porn, these things that I have in my mind that I think about every day, I'll always have those things. But now they're a reminder every time I think about them that they were designed to kill, to steal, and destroy, but I know I'm going to deal with them. So going forward, now I get to go, yeah, but Jesus, Jesus is the answer. I don't have to go there because I'm not going to find fulfillment in that. I don't have to go to that as a resource because I don't, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to ever experience that fulfillment that God has for my life. Idols are defeated not by being removed, but by being replaced. So today, let's replace those. When you walk out of here, you can, take and, you can write on there whatever you want to. But when you take it, this is going to sit on my nightstand. And every single day when I get up, I'm going to have something to look at. And I'm going to have a reminder of the work that Jesus did in my life. And my goal today is for you to walk out of here different than you were when you walked in. For you to walk out of here and go, I have some problems, but I'm not going to stay that way. I have some addictions, but I can overcome them. Because God had that plan. He had that purpose for my life. So would you pray with all heads bowed and all eyes closed? I want to, I want to talk to you for just a second. And, and as Worley said at the beginning of the service in worship, he said, he said, you know what? Today you'll have an opportunity. If you're not a Christian and you're here today and you're not a Christian, that you'll have an opportunity to respond and say, you know what? I, I have some problems in my life, but I want to see Jesus do something in my life. I need, I need this thing in my life. And if you've said here in this room that there's something that's in the place that does not satisfy me the way that I thought it should, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then today is the day that you take that next step and say, I want to have a relationship with him. That I say, it's time that I call it what it is. It's time that I step into a relationship. Because let me promise you something. As a, as a Christian follower, because you make that decision, your problems will not just go away. But now there'll be something that you can strain towards overcoming because of the work that Jesus has already done for you. They become a stepping stone to, be, to set you to the place that God has for your life. But it all starts with having a relationship with him. The Bible is clear for us that it says that all we have to do is believe in him and confess that Jesus is Lord. We, we, ask, we ask God for forgiveness of our sins, our imperfections. God is saying all we have to do is just say, you know what, I'm not perfect. I've got some issues in my life that I need to overcome. And Jesus, I need you to be a part of it. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you. And if you're here today and you have some addictions in your life and you are a Christian, I want to include you in on this prayer too. Because there's a moment in our lives where at all the time, or at all times, there's something trying to take the place that Jesus has for our lives. I deal with it every single day. There's a problem that we're dealing with that is trying to be put in the place that only Jesus can be put in. And today's the day that you can make that decision to go, I'm getting rid of that. And I'm focusing back on you, Lord. I'm focusing back on you, Jesus, because I know the plan and I know the purpose that you have for my life. I know that you want a life in abundance for me and I want that for my life. So would you just pray with me uh, together? You don't have to pray out loud. You can just pray quietly in your seat. But Jesus, right now, we just thank you. Thank you for the work that you did on the cross for us. Thank you that we don't have to be chained to our problems and our issues anymore. That we don't have to be perfect, God, but that we can overcome anything because of what you've done for our lives. And right now, Jesus says, we hold this trophy in our hands and we think about those things that, that are hurting us, those things that are causing problems in our marriages, those things that are causing uh, desires inside of our hearts that we know we shouldn't deal with. But we keep going back to them over and over again. God, I pray that they will no longer become a place that takes captive, ta captivity over us, but they'll become a place that we look back to of the work that you've already done and the work that you want to do in our lives. 
and God, we just thank you so much for sending Jesus. That you knew from the beginning of time that we would not have what it takes. That we wouldn't have it all together and that we wouldn't be able to accomplish anything on our own. And you knew that. And that's why you sent Jesus. So today, Father, I just pray right now all over this room that if people don't have a relationship with you, God, or they've stepped out of a relationship with you because they're pursuing something else, that today will be the day that they come home. Today will be the day that they decide to put you back in that place of number one. Because we know, God, that as we pursue one thing, we'll never find fulfillment in that by taking it away, God, but we'll, we'll only find that fulfillment in replacing it with you. I thank you for the work that you're doing in people's lives today, Jesus. And I thank you for the plan and the purpose that you have for every single one of our lives. In your name we pray. Everybody says, amen.